Well, good evening, everybody, um, and a very, very warm welcome to you to this is the third online event um, of 2021 and the seventh in our series of talks hosted by the Compassion Training Centre. Um, my name is Carolyn Bryce, and um, I'm the Chief Executive of the Compassion Fund in the UK. It's wonderful to see so many of you with us on the Zoom room and also I know I can't hear you, Carolyn. Sorry. I hear her. That I realised. I can't hear you clearly. It's very quiet. Is that any better? To be honest, you were great at the start and then you disappeared. I can't hear you. Well, I don't think, I don't think anybody can hear you, Carolyn. Maybe you can hear us. Now? Yeah, I heard yeah. you then. Better? Yeah. yeah. Very soft. I'm very soft, okay, sorry. Um, is that any better? Yes, that's better. Better? better. Yes. 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 Okay. Right, where did we get to? <laughs> Just to say, um, we've been running these events now um, since summer 2020, and we've heard some wonderfully inspiring speakers who are themselves um, brief parents or brief siblings. And our, um, our aim with these events really is to let you know that you're not alone. And our hope today is that you may find something in what our speaker Jane offers tonight. Uh, that resonates with you and gives you a glimpse of light and hope in what sometimes can feel like a, a tunnel or fog of darkness uh, that we find ourselves sometimes in, in after the loss of a child. I just wanted to ha do some small ha housekeeping items first. Um, you may want to go to speak of you. So there's a toggle at the top of your screen, uh, which it has view next to it and you can be if you're a speaker view you'll just see the speaker if you're on gallery view you'll see all the little boxes so it's up to you what how you want to view but you might just want to see the speaker um also we're recording this event as we usually do so that those who aren't, who aren't able to be here um, can listen at a later date and your presence here as usual indicates that you consent to this recording Everyone has been muted when you came in, as we've got over 130 people joining us this evening. Um, so we ask you please to stay muted um, because of that number and it will become very noisy if we all unmute. So um, if you could stay muted and use the chat function um, should you wish to, to respond and comment during Jane's talk. However, we would really respectfully ask you to keep the chat um, to the minimum during the talk, as it can sometimes be really difficult to listen to our speaker if there's a lot of chat flashing up on the screen. So thank you for that. Thank you for your cooperation on that. After Jane has spoken tonight, we, have, we will of course warmly invite your questions, your comments, any feedback, um, which uh, we would then ask you to put into the chat, uh, any questions or comments. I'll field, field those questions and any feedback to Jane um, to, for her response. And we plan to finish our time together about 8 or 8.15, 8.15 um, at the latest. So thank you to everyone who registered to attend and to those who were able to offer us a voluntary do donation when you booked. We're hugely grateful, particularly at this time when many charities are struggling for funds. Your support means an immense amount to us. They've been, it's been absolutely critical in helping us adapt this year and continue to offer our peer support and hope and understanding and hope as we find a way through our grief and loss together. So now I'm hugely delighted to be able to welcome to the Compassionate Friends Jane Unjun, our guest speaker this evening. Just a few words about Jane by way of introduction, as I know she will be telling you something more of her story 
as she speaks to us tonight. But just suffice to say, Jane trained as a general counsellor with Westminster Pastoral Foundation in 1993, and then went on to train with Crews Bereavement Care. She's worked providing one-to-one -one bereavement support in her local community in London, as well as developing and running training for future cruise counsellors. Jane, of course, has her own bereavement experiences, tragically having lost her, her mother at the age of 16, and also her first child, Jeremy, when he was just 14 months old. These experiences led her to develop the bereavement journey in 1995, and that's a six session course designed to help grieving people in small groups. She ran this at Holy Trinity Brompton for 23 years and now continues to run it from her home at, um, in West Sussex. And the bereavement journey material was all filmed in 2015 and the course now runs all over the UK and overseas. Jane is also the founder trustee of the umbrella organization called At A Loss, who provide a comprehensive UK signposting website for anyone who's bereaved and those supporting them. Please do take a look at their website. There's lots of resources there for you, for anyone who is grieving a loved one. And finally, Jane was um, richly deserved. She was awarded an MBE in the Queen's Birthday Honours List in 2020 for her services to the bereaved. So thank you so much, Jane, for taking the time to be with us this evening. And we're looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you very much um, for your introduction. Well, it's a great privilege actually to have been asked to talk to you all today, but uh, I don't think I was invited by Carolyn to speak to you because I've got any sort of trailblazing problem solving expertise or any shortcuts to offer you about what you're going through. I'm, I'm simply another parent like you who has lost a beloved child a child who was yours, whether by birth or through guardianship or through adoption. I'm probably just a bit further along the journey than most of you, my son having died in 1978. I wonder if just for a moment uh, you would imagine that COVID restrictions are not in place. Imagine this gathering happening in a big hall somewhere and you have journeyed here, feeling maybe a bit apprehensive, wondering perhaps if you should have come at all. And then you'd have sat down, most probably next to someone you didn't know, and possibly wondered why they were here. And if we could have done some brief introductions, like many of you will have experienced in a small group setting, if we could have said our name and who our child was who had died, then I believe we would be simply overwhelmed with empathy and with compassion and with love for one another. Because we all share this one cruel and unnatural experience, the death of a child. So you are, albeit remotely, among friends. And I am among friends and we'll do it with Zoom. I'm going to start this evening by telling you something of my own story, because it sets the scene for the work that I've been involved in for the past 25 years. And then I'll offer you a little of what I have picked up along the way, both from my own experience of loss and from those with whom I've had the privilege of working. If some of what I say sounds difficult or impossible or outright offensive to you, then I apologize. And I ask that you just let it fall away. Our grief experiences within this one meeting are so varied. And although I've tried to be sensitive to all the circumstances that I could imagine, I will most likely fail to steer a satisfactory course at all times. So for this, please forgive me and discard anything unhelpful as just not for you. But I do hope that you'll all be able to take away something that is an encouragement in your situation. So to tell you 
something of my story. My childhood was spent in a family with a mother and a father and one sister who is 10 years older than me, the Second World War coming in between us. When I was 12, my sister got married and my father left the family within the same three months. So the family dynamic changed very quickly and very dramatically. My mother became ill the following year with cancer, but as was sadly the norm back then, I wasn't really told about it. And I never gave it a thought except to grumble quite a bit at her frequent hospital stays, which were inconvenient to me. When I was just 16, I was approached by a friend at school in late January, who told me how sorry she was that my mum was dying. I had absolutely no idea what she was talking about, so I went crying to the headmistress, uh, who obviously arranged for me to go home. My mum died six weeks later, at the beginning of March. And shortly afterwards, I went back to school. It was my O-level year, which you would, uh, most of you would know as GCSE, and my exams were coming up. But no one ever mentioned or talked to me about my mother's death, no teacher, uh, no family friends actually, and I never saw anybody cry for her. I think actually I almost felt embarrassed by her death in a way. I certainly didn't want to stick out in a crowd. So I tried very hard to go on as normal. Fortunately, I went to live with my newly married sister and I studied hard, I lost myself in work and I took my exams. I pushed all my grief deep inside me and I think I believed I had dealt with it. But now I see, and I've heard from friends who knew me then that I was like someone behind a glass screen or one of those Victorian stuffed animals in a glass bell jar. I played the swinging 60s role okay with the false eyelashes and the faded jeans, but I was cut off from my friends. I was cut off from my experiences and from my buried feelings of grief, which all waited to surprise me a few years later. So fast forward 13 years and I was already married. I married at 20 years old, scooped up by a young man called Nick who had a vision and a plan, which was something I certainly didn't have. And we had moved abroad for his work and we were living in a country where I couldn't get a work permit. So we decided to start a family young. However, it took a very long 10 years for that to happen. But at last, our first child was born in 1977, a little boy, and we called him Jeremy. You just never imagine, do you, that things that have at one point seemed so perfect can suddenly and without warning go so wrong. When he was 14 months old, Jeremy caught a kind of gastroenteritis bug from a little friend. And within three days, he had died. It was unbelievable, incomprehensible, preposterous even. Our lives took a further downturn as my husband, Nick, who was actually away traveling in the Middle East for work when this happened, came home and fell into a terrible depression. Now this is something he has talked about a lot and shared with many since that dark time. He lost his job and he in fact didn't work for over a year. <clears throat> so it was the collapse of all that we knew and we found ourselves in this terrifying new landscape, a landscape without a vocabulary and without a map. But, there was one huge difference between that time and what I had experienced previously when my mother had died. There was instant, caring, knowledgeable support made available to us, and that was a lifesaver. Our GP suggested almost immediately that we should each visit a separate counsellor. 
a nick was given antidepressants which helped considerably and we had a handful of friends and family who drew in really close to support us. I have only one unhelpful memory of that time when an elderly family friend took us aside to say about three months after Jeremy had died <clears throat> that it really was time to stop this grief and that in his words enough is enough. <clears throat> Excuse me. An equally strong and the most touching memory from that time is of the elderly mother of a close friend, um, an old lady known affectionately as Boiler, because she used to get so steamed up about things when she was little. She had uh, several grown up children, but she had lost a child as a young woman. We entered the room at her house and walked slowly towards her. She was in her 80s at the time and had very bad vision. Is that Nick and Jane? She asked her son, as she couldn't quite tell. When he replied, yes, mother. She slowly started to walk towards us, saying nothing. Her hands outstretched, her eyes streaming with tears. I've never forgotten that special moment of connection. When I started my counselling after Jeremy's death, a really extraordinary thing that happened was that I spent the first six sessions talking about my mother and her death. Actually, I still can't believe it. My precious baby boy had just died. My husband was in a de the depths of a debilitating depression. And yet this buried grief came out first. Many years later, I would remember this as I trained to work with the bereaved. I knew from experience that even the most reluctant person like me could be helped and supported through grief rather than being left to shut down or hide in one of the multitude of ways that we manage to pretend that the present is not actually happening at all. So to conclude this little history, some 18 years later, and with three more children, now all in school, I trained as a counsellor. Um, I worked <clears throat> with Cruz Bereavement Care so that I could work with people in the community where we lived in West London. And while at Cruz, I got involved with training future counsellors, which we did in groups of 10 or so. And I just found the whole group experience tremendously valuable and effective. So it was at that point I decided to write up my own five session grief program, which as Carolyn mentioned, I called the bereavement journey. Well, this all happened some 25 years ago and um, we're still going strong with all the short talks now filmed and the bereavement journey being shown all over the country and of course running now via Zoom. And we found that most people, even if a bit resistant at the start, can really benefit from sharing their stories. And of course, that's not new. The founders of the Compassionate Friends discovered this through their own tragic losses in 1969. And many other charities and groups use the same small group approach to finding healing and meaning in the face of the great challenges of life. But the deep roots of the bereavement journey lay in that profound difference that I had experienced between no help and some help. The difference between not acknowledging my loss and attending to it, between running away or standing my ground and facing the worst thing that had ever happened to me. Well, that's enough of my story. But what I shall say to you now is, of course, birthed in this story and informed by the hundreds of people I've met and sat with over the past 25 years as they have worked through their grief. And it's been such encouraging and inspiring work. My central message to you today is twofold, and it's been my principal message for all these years. Firstly, 
How you travel on your grief journey is your decision alone. Now, I know I've just been speaking about the huge benefits of support, professional and otherwise. And it's wonderful if others can be alongside you to help and even to advise you from time to time. But ultimately, I encourage you to trust your own instincts and to go at your own pace, however slow it feels and however much you feel you may be going mad. As a grief specialist Colin Murray Parks writes, patterns of grief are like fingerprints, personal to you only. No one else has walked exactly your path. No one else has your individual mix of so many factors, the circumstances around the death, your personality type, your cultural background, your concurrent stresses, your previous experience of loss, so much that makes your story unique. So just don't worry <clears throat> about doing the right thing or about getting over it in a particular time frame. If you need your child's sweatshirt in bed with you to be able to get to sleep at night, if you carry a toy or a precious object around with you in your handbag or in your jacket pocket, that's okay. If you want photographs of him or her all around you, or like me, you put them all away because it's too painful, that's okay too. You will know when to put the sweatshirt into the drawer beside your bed or when to wash those precious clothes that smell of your child your teenager, your young person. When to put that toy or memento into a safe place. Take your time and wait for the day when you can read those letters or look at those documents that you haven't been able to look at up to now. Sort those cupboards, even change that bedroom that right now you can't imagine ever using for anything or anyone else. As I say this, I'm reminded of a family whose older of two daughters died while traveling in Africa. The younger daughter, Nessa, who was 17 years old, became my client, and I saw her every week for about a year. One day she arrived in obvious distress, angry with her parents, because they were hosting a teacher from a school in Africa where her sister had worked, and they needed and planned to use her sister's bedroom as a guest room for him to sleep in. The bedroom hadn't been used or touched since her sister had gone away. During the session, I waited and listened and waited and hoped, hoped that she would work out the solution. And she did. Five minutes before the end, she suddenly said, I know, I'll sleep in there and he can have my room. And so that's what happened. And the result was that the veto on using or changing that room softened. And soon after that, she began to borrow some of her sister's clothes and look at her things and sit in there to listen to music. She had worked out her own answer in her own time to the dilemma and it benefited all the family. So the time will come when you feel you can do these difficult things, perhaps prompted by some outside need as it was for Nessa. But we're all able to find answers if we're patient. Things which in the beginning feel impossible or unbearable do become possible in the fullness of time, but grief should not and will not be hurried along. And when the time comes to make a gentle change, when a certain season of grief feels as if it's drawing to a close, you will know it. And no one does you a service by encouraging you to get on with it before time. Now, I should just add here that, of course, I recognize that there are times and situations which do require that people make changes before they're ready. And that is really hard. 
you will be very aware if you're having to let go of things before time or are being hurried along because of outside circumstances. So stick with those friends who are prepared to sit with you patiently in the mess of the ditch that grief often feels like. And don't feel you must heed those who are trying to pull you out of the ditch before you're ready. Grief takes time and cliche that it is, time does heal and your intuition will guide you. So that was my first point. How you travel on your grief journey is your decision alone. And so you can trust your own instincts and go at your own pace. My second is this. In every circumstance, even the very worst, we do all have an element of choice. This choice is about how we will respond to adversity. Whatever has happened to us, therefore, however tragic that event may be, however unfair, our response is going to be the key to the quality, the direction, and the impact of the rest of our lives. The actor, Christopher Reeve, who played the original Superman, some of you, I guess, might be old enough to remember him, was injured in a riding accident and he was left quadriplegic. He spent the rest of his life campaigning for those with disabilities. He said, suffering is inevitable, but misery is a choice. Now, I'm not saying to you that I sat down after Jeremy died and made this kind of decision. I didn't, it didn't cross my mind. But as the months went on, I found and I drew upon a determination not to go under a determination to understand what was happening and to work with it as far as I was able and to survive. I was in touch last week with a friend at home down here in West Sussex called Penny. She lost her youngest son on a gap year adventure whilst he was traveling in South America. He fell from a mountain path and was killed instantly. A few months after this terrible accident, Penny wrote to me and this is what she said. I decided almost immediately that this tragedy could not become the defining moment of my life. It was not to swallow me up. Now, she'd be the first to admit that this has not been easy and that at times she has felt herself to be very far away from this resolve. But at the time, much nearer to the event, she already recognized that although her life was thrown into chaos and despair, this must not be the thing which effectively ended or placed immovable boundaries around her life. I found that an extraordinary response and wish. She felt, I think, that her son would not be honored or his life celebrated if that were the case. So my encouragement is that you try, if you have not already done so, to find a way to engage with grief. Now, to some of you, this must sound like an outrageous suggestion. Why should I accept and work with this enemy who has ruined my life? But loss and grief can paradoxically help us to discover so much about ourselves but we need to be willing to dig deep, to look at parts of ourselves that are a bit rough around the edges, that are perhaps well camouflaged and hidden from public view. But eventually, sometime after the first terrible months or the first painful year, the opportunity will present itself to engage with grief to inhabit it and even to embrace loss with an act of will in the belief that this will find and provide the key to finding hope once again. So perhaps <clears throat> with reluctant acceptance, we can start to attend to some 
of those troublesome feelings which do demand our attention, such as anger, guilt, and fear. I imagine that this is what many of you experience in the groups run by the Compassionate Friends, ideal settings to explore difficult feelings. If we're willing to give time and thought to these demands, then we will grow in understanding and in insight and as a byproduct in compassion for others. Now, I must also point out here that I do realize it's not always possible to allow grief to take you on its roller coaster ride. You may have many other responsibilities, caring for children and other family, working to earn a living, studying for exams or some other important task which must be achieved. It isn't always possible to take the risk of going with grief, I see that. But if you can, then do. I love the analogy of fearing grief as we might fear the dark as the sun sets. So we chase the sun as it sinks in the west as a way of avoiding that which we most fear. Actually, the picture I'm talking about is that we turn and face the dark and walk through it and greet the sun as it rises in the east. I ran west when my mother died and I never found the light. It was only by journeying east many years later that slowly things began to make more sense. So <clears throat> I'm talking about response, about attending to those things which call for our attention. And two of these things may well for you be anger and or guilt. They are powerful, often unrecognized or unacknowledged, and they can have such a grip on us. I had quite a battle with each of these uncomfortable feelings after Jeremy died. Firstly, anger. In spite of all my counseling, I effectively managed to bury my anger about his death and particularly about the events in the hospital where he died. And here I'd like to make clear that we were still living abroad at this time so it was nothing to do with the National Health Service. I remember doing a session on anger during my training as a counselor. And while my fellow students were tearing up great sheets of paper and scribbling furious words and shapes with permanent black marker pens, I just sat quietly in my corner and folded my A1 sheet of paper into a neat small package. I wasn't angry at all. A few months later, however, I was invited to a day-long anger workshop with an American psychologist called George. When my turn came to tell my story, I talked about the hospital and Jeremy dying there. And George sent me to one corner of the room and he quietly briefed a few people to be ready to hold on to me if need be. He then sent another poor man outside the door of the room and after a few moments, he summoned him in, telling me, here is the doctor coming to tell you that your son has died. Well, all I can say is that the air turned blue. I shouted, I screamed, I had to be physically restrained from hitting him. I had certainly not managed to attend to my anger over Jeremy's death, even with all the help I had received. But importantly, I had such peace after this exercise. My anger had finally been acknowledged and validated. Many years later, young friends of ours lost their first and only child, a daughter, to cancer. The father, Paul, rang me one day and asked if his wife could come and spend the day with me down here in Sussex. I need to allow myself to get really angry, he said, and I'm afraid it will frighten Joe. So she came for the day and she knew what he needed to do. He stayed alone at home. He got all their little girl's clothes out and laid them on the bed in her room. And he shouted and he beat the mattress and then he cried and he cried. He just had to find a way to let it out. And I really admire his insight and the courage that it took to access all that pain. Another really hard feeling, which will hold back our healing if not recognized, is guilt. 
with the death of a child or young person, it's so easy to feel guilt for not protecting them, for not preventing what happened, for not managing to find a cure, or perhaps for not managing to make their life worth living. The trouble is that so many things appear different with hindsight. It's so easy to blame ourselves for what we did or didn't do. If only we'd known then what we know now. So we really do have to try to be kind to ourselves over guilt. People are very rarely actually responsible for the death of a loved one. I live with the guilt over Jeremy's death because I was persuaded to go home and rest as I had been nursing him for three days and he died without me there. Since that time, all of our children have been in hospital for various things and we've never left them for a moment. I know that now. I know that you stay there all the time if you possibly can. But I didn't know it then and I wasn't offered anywhere to rest. I was told to go home. I can't say that I'm at peace with it, even now, 43 years later, but I have worked on it and I have forgiven myself for my, na my naivety and my lack of life experience. Well, <clears throat> at this stage of my time with you, I probably should address my title, Finding Hope After Losing a Child. Hope in my experience starts very small. It's a tiny glimmer of light, a tiny speck on the horizon, an almost invisible thing. Nick and I both have memories of being surprised by a moment of hope after Jeremy's death. Mine occurred when I went up to the high street uh, to the post office. It was a sunny day and I walked past a lovely street barrow selling some flowers and pot plants near our home. I saw a peace lily with its soft white flowers and its deep green leaves. I could suddenly imagine it in our sitting room, looking alive and cheerful and promising. I bought it. I carried it for a few hundred yards with a palpable feeling of energy and anticipation. And then the shutters dropped and the reality set in. And I remembered who I was and what we were living through, not least that we didn't have the money to waste on a house plant. What could a peace lily change in all of that? But of course, it already had. I had felt hopeful about our future for several minutes and I've never forgotten that moment. Nick had a similar experience at around the same time. He wasn't working and he was on a walk around the streets near our home. He passed a shop which sold televisions and the whole shop window was hung with televisions of every make all showing the same program, which was probably, possibly the, the 1978 um, European Athletics Championship in Prague. Two famous British runners were in a race and Nick loved running, it had become the mainstay of his battle against depression. So he stopped and stood transfixed, urging on his favorite, thrilled by the excitement of the race. His favorite won, and then it was over. And he too then thought, well, what does that change in my life? These tiny pinpoints of light start to glimmer a little more often as we hop from one to the next. We begin to hold the previous one in our memory as we await the next small encouragement. Gradually, we start to assimilate this loss that is so unbearable into our very core. It becomes part of the fabric of who we are and who we are becoming. One mother, spoke to me at the time after the death of her teenage daughter as looking at the world as if through a, a fog. And then she said, um, I realized one day that the fog had descended. It was <clears throat> still there, but I could see out over the top of it. 
I believe that slowly we move towards the bigger picture. Our child is now part of who we are. He's our story. He informs how we will now choose to live. He has changed us, usually for the better, a thing that's not easy to admit and is very difficult to accept. The heartbreak and the despair that we experience eventually become the stepping stones to something beyond. And we would be wise to have some sort of a vision for what that might look like. Many years ago, I saw a middle-aged couple for counselling who had lost their only child, a young man of 21. He was at university. Somehow he ended up being struck by a train. It was an appalling loss. I spent many hours sitting with them as they struggled to find any sense in life for themselves going forward. And I then lost touch with them as they decided to leave London. But about three years ago, I heard that they had decided to move right away. They'd moved to Canada to live in the mountains. They'd both taken up new interests and they'd begun on a different journey. The pain of their great loss must always be so real for them, but it has, I suspect, become an integral part of who they now are, and they have declined to become victims and have chosen to thrive, albeit in a previously unimagined way. Their journey reminds me of a quote by psychologist <clears throat> Bruno Bettelheim. Can we turn the maze of bereavement into a labyrinth of hope, working towards the centre, our soul. A maze, you see, is a place full of dead ends, frustration and exhaustion. A labyrinth, on the other hand, has a single continuous path which leads toward the centre. And as long as we keep going forward, we eventually get there. We just have to resolve to keep on going. So in conclusion, the loss of a child is an outrage. It's a distortion of nature. No words can be said, few actions taken to make things feel any better. The world and life itself seem random and indiscriminate. In the beginning, we make it through the day minute by minute, hour by hour. Every day is the same as the world seems to take no notice and to carry on turning oblivious to our pain. We are consumed by questions to which there appear to be no answers. And as we journey on, we have to learn to live with these questions, with this unknowing, trusting that eventually wisdom and maturity may grow out of this apparent ignorance. Your great loss will become an integral part of who you will now be and who you will be for other people. Could that too be something worthwhile? Not worth their death, of course, but something beautiful that could come out of this tragedy. The American church pastor, Rick Warren, whose 27 year old son tragically took his own life said, our deepest life message will come out of our deepest pain. What could that look like in your family, in your neighborhood, in your context? Can you imagine translating some of this devastation into something life-giving, something that could touch another person as Boiler touched us that day with her wordless empathy and love? As you seek hope, I want to encourage you to have faith in the remarkable ability of the human mind and spirit to heal. Faith in the power of the support of your friends and family who hold you when you feel you will fall forever. Faith in love, which is the greatest and most powerful force in our human experience. And faith in hope, that gentle and sometimes elusive distant light 
which sits in the future and calls us to persevere and not to give up. Our story must be a story of life in spite of death. A story of perseverance in spite of attack. Of survival in spite of exhaustion. A story of engagement with this unwanted, unbidden journey. All of this initially as an act of willpower, as we wait for our emotions to catch up and for hope itself to settle gently into our soul and make there its unlikely yet absolute home. I would like to finish by reading you a short poem by the 19th century American poet, Emily Dickinson. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chillest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jane. I'm just going to have a few, just a few seconds quiet. Well, Jane, you said it was a privilege to come and speak to us. But actually, it's been a huge privilege to hear your story and to, to hear your words of wisdom um, over the last 35 minutes. Um, we come to the part where um, if there is any questions or feedback or comments that anyone would like to make. Um, I know Jane is happy to stay and, and answer any anything from you all. If you would like to just type something into the chat, um, I'd be happy to feed that. We've got some lovely comments, Jane. Thank you, oh. wonderful words and very inspiring. Thank you, thank you so much. <sighs> I thought what you said about hope starting very small, I could really relate to that. Mm -hmm. As I remember feeling um, in the, the days and the weeks and the months and even in the early years of my daughter dying, that I was always going to be crying for her. I just couldn't imagine ever feeling, looking forward to the future, but it does start very with those very small things. I see somebody wanted to see know the, the surname of Bruno. Yeah. Um, he's called Bruno Bettelheim, B E double T E L H E I M, Bruno Bettelheim. <laughs> yeah, hope starts very small. Um, and it's hard to hold on to those little pinpoints, but I think we must look for them. Mm, lovely. There's a question here. Is there an equivalent to this for siblings uh, from Lisa? Um, do you mean compassionate friends? I think maybe do, you know, peer support for siblings. We do offer some um, support for um, bereaved adult siblings, so 18. Um, well, we have a Facebook page um, where, and we also run some retreats, Lisa, as well, um, for siblings in normal times. I suppose the Child Bereavement Trust would be yeah. something, um, and actually the yeah. Atalos website would help with those sorts of things. Child, uh, Winston's Wish also um, in certain parts of the country for children. There's a question here from Diane, and um, thank you, Jane. What do you do when grief hits you again years later? Um, I, I think my, my answer would be that uh, 
you can't we can't ignore it. We can't do the thing that we you know, but I, which I described about thinking, oh well, I, I really can't put up with you. Now we, we've we've got to, we've got to attend to it, and so um, there are many things that revive grief. You know, new things happen to us, and old hurts get revived very quickly. They won't take as long, probably, as that first time, but I think that it's really important to to make space um, to attend when grief hits you again if you can find somebody to walk alongside you whether that's in a group or a counselor or a trusted friend um i would say it's really important to share it with somebody don't not bottle it up kind of the same advice as the first time around but um don't um don't don't think that it shouldn't be there and you're not going to give it the time um it, it's always it's never welcome but equally um it, it needs to, to, it needs the attention. Mm. Thank you. Um, there's a question here from Gillian. I'm not sure that I have addressed my anger. What do you re recommend people do to unearth it and face it? Anger is a, a really difficult one <clears throat> and it's quite hard to find, you know, um, places to go to, 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 but I think you make a start by doing things um, yourself. I, I, it depends what you, I'm a writer, so I, I like to write things down. So I think um, it, you, could, you could begin to, to journal or to write down or write a letter or, um, or write a letter to, to, either to the person who's died or to the person pe uh, who, who you feel the anger might be directed to, um, or to take up, um, you know, if, I don't know, if you, if, if you paint or you, I don't know, use clay or something that you can pound away. You know, it's a question of finding a place where you can try and get some anger out of you. Um, going to a remote place, even on the, on the beach and, and shouting and sort of shouting, seeing what, what comes. It's, it's just important to not to pent it all up in, inside. And so finding a way of expressing anger, even if it starts quite mild, um, just depending on what, what your what hobbies or activities you're into um you know just it's really worth uh, and, and again you know if you feel there's really quite a bit of anger there then i would really consider trying to have somebody work with you perhaps for six sessions fo focusing on anger and see if you can you can access it that way thank you there's a there's another question here about how can we help family and friends to relate to our experience <clears throat> mm. It's a hard one that isn't it because it's a really hard one um because they can't really imagine it so we have to be a bit vulnerable don't we to um to let them in um and i suppose all we can do is to share with people in as much as we feel comfortable about how it feels for us and the things that help and the things that don't help you know it, it Family, people often think, for example, it would be better not to talk about the child or the person by name because that must make them unhappy. When actually the only thing we want is for people to use their name and talk about them. So, you know, it's, it's often rather the opposite of what people in their fear will do. And so we, we probably have to say to people, um, I'd, I'd really love to, you know, I would have to say, I'd, I'd really love to talk to you about Jeremy rather than sort of having them skirt around um, skirt around his name and the fact that he's died. So I think we, we have to share with people a bit about how it actually feels and see if, we, if, they, if they will be drawn um, in, a, a bit closer into the relationship. People are so fearful of death, fearful of, of um, grief in other people um, that it, some of the onus is always on the on the grieving person almost to to um it's the same with wanting help too i think people are very good at saying do give me a call if there's anything you want but the last thing that we have the energy to do actually is <laughs> is call you know um but of course if we can say well i'm just not managing to walk the dog or you know i i wish someone would just cook a few meals and put them in my freezer it, it some people need to do something practical to help and that helps to draw them just into the into the wider picture, and 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 that can break the ice somewhat. <clears throat> the 
Did you say something, Jane, about there's a sort of question about sadness? You talked about anger and you've talked about um, guilt. Could you say something about um, the overwhelming sadness that many of us feel that it, it just seems, life just seems, yeah, just very, very sad. Yes, yeah. yes. And I think um, another thing which I probably haven't mentioned, which comes with sadness, um, with grief is often disappointment. Disappointment because, because we, we do have a sort of vision, all of us, about how our lives might be and how things might pan out. And we don't factor into that um, things going wrong. And disappointment is a great thief. That sadness is a thief, but sadness is a, is, is, a, is a really natural feeling. Disappointment is a real thief because it comes to take away even more from us. And so I think with all, with, as with all feelings, we need to name we need, you need, we need to name them and face them. You know, the, 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 the gut reaction is, I'm gonna run away from this, but any of these uncomfortable feelings are, are, are sort of, it's better if we can to, 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 to be able to confront them and name them. But sadness is, um, we, we, can't, we can't magically do away with sadness. Sadness is always mixed sadness. You know, I read a wonderful thing the other day about sadness and joy being like two plants that miraculously can grow in the same soil. Not happiness, but sadness and joy. We can be joyful in a deep, deep place that we've had that love, we've had that connection, we've had that child, we've had that young person. And the sadness is, is, is twinned with it, but, um, but, but they do grow in the same soil in a strange way, sadness and joy. And, um, and so, we would do well to remember that, I think. Do, do you think there's a question here um, about anger, and I think it might apply to sadness or any kind of like, strong mm. emotion. Do you think if you don't deal with, with those or face them, as you said, mm. that that turns into depression? Um, well, I think that, I think, yes, I think anger can, can turn into so many things. I think it can um, it, it it can turn into into depression. Uh, it can turn into physical illness. Actually, I mean, you know, we all know how our bodies respond so um, dramatically to how we're actually feeling, what we're holding on to. Um, I think it can be misplaced onto the wrong people, and therefore it damages relationships. I think that grief is very hard in marriages. That you know the statistics are not great for, 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 for marriages and how they do after the death of a child. You probably would be more um, familiar with them than I am, but you know, that there are strains. You, you, people sort of imagine from the outside, I think that if you're a couple, it's wonderful because you've got each other and you'll grieve together. It doesn't really work like that, I don't think. Um, certainly in our case, there was kind of always one of us in pieces and one of us kind of on duty and then the one on duty would collapse and the other one would have to pick themselves up. And so, so I think that um, anger, anger's another thief in a way. Anger, anger will situate itself somewhere um, because it needs to be somewhere and it's quite often in the wrong place. And I do remember, I do remember thinking when I was counseling that people who came through for counseling quite early on um, were often angry very angry with hospitals, doctors, nurses, priests, undertakers, you know, there was a lot of anger around um, <clears throat> at sort of acceptable places to put the anger. And that as the weeks and months would go on, the anger would, would find perhaps its, its true place of, of what they really were angry about. I think most of us are very uncomfortable with angry feelings. I mean, I was from the examples I showed you and I was hopeless with anger and um, and so much of that with anger also depends on the kind of family we grew up in and many children are not allowed to express angry feelings in families because it's thought to be bad behavior but if we're never allowed to explore anger as we grow up and now we're grown-ups with this terrible these terrible angry feelings we don't really know how to deal with them so I think we often need help actually um, but exploring in a small group can be hugely helpful.
you know, I imagine going into one of your groups once your groups can meet again or even on Zoom and being able to talk about angry feelings and have somebody who you hardly know mirroring and saying, that's just how I feel. I don't know what to do. And it, it, it you know, it, it is, it normalizes it is, is it in some way. So you just feel, oh, it's not, I'm not a bad person. I'm just a grieving person who's holding on to difficult feelings. So it's, it's the willingness to be vulnerable um, and open is, is key in all of these really. I was, as you were talking about difficult feelings, actually, I was thinking about um, our, our groups, our support groups, and how, how freeing it is to be able to talk yeah. about those yeah. difficult feelings, which are, diff are hard to talk to friends and family about. Um, yes, very hard, very hard. Much, much easier to talk to people who, um, who you don't know really very well, who don't know your family and your and you're, and, you're, and and actually there's such a feeling of trust you see in small groups that come together through things like this there's such a feeling of trust and that's a wonderful thing it comes almost from from sort of session one day one i think and and, and they and those people hold can hold your anger for you in a safe place from week to week or month to month however however much you you meet you know mm. so it's a good place to start i think and, and could, could you say um, something about, there's some questions about surviving children and um, maybe not, you know, not wanting to speak about their brother or sister. Yes. Um, yes. Well, um, so in my own experience, obviously, I didn't have other children, but I have worked with families with surviving children and I've worked with a few children myself. Um, children. Children need to be helped on a sort of need to know basis and in an age appropriate way. Children will have questions. Young children will have questions that we wouldn't think of. Um, doesn't, um, do doesn't my brother, you know, need food in his coffin? <laughs> Won't he be hungry? You know, um, um, will, you know, they have questions about burial, questions about cremation. And I think we, we, with little children, we really generally um, tend to make up rather magical things which aren't very helpful. Children are really good with an appropriate level of the truth. Um, and if they're not comfortable with it, they'll ask another question. And if they are comfortable, they'll then say, can I have some chocolate or can we have an ice cream? And they'll know that the door is open for another question. So I think the key thing is, um, there are some wonderful resources for children um, on either the cruise bereavement care book list, or you've probably got your own reading list as well, and on or on at a loss. There are some very good age books for little children and right through to teenagers. There are good books for teenagers, all ages, but there are workbooks for younger children that involve drawing and um, imagination, which allow discussion about why why is why have you put that over there or why have you colored this that color or that sort of thing so i think that's and and if you know one one isn't looking for problems but equally i think that we need to um, model to children that grief is okay because we don't want them internalizing their grief and carrying it with them so children seeing us crying of course, not if we're in a complete heap in a chair and in bed all day, every day. But, you know, to be able to cry and then say, I'm feeling sad about Jeremy. But I've had a little cry and now, you know, I'm fine. and I'm really looking forward to spending some time with you or whatever. But it's it's good to model um, grief because most children, it's, it's hidden from a lot of children because people think that it will upset them. Mm. And that's a that's not a helpful thing. And, and not having children to funerals and that kind of thing, I think it's just so, I, I think mostly now we, we, we do take children to funerals, but you know, we didn't used to, we used to put, put them out to play with somebody for the day and they'd come back and everything was over. There's also older siblings as well, which is, and, 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 and friends of our oldest. Yes. So older siblings, what I've found with young people is that they find it, um, hard for, to, for their peer group to understand. They just don't. 
So they kind of peer group, some, but a friend will ring up and just say, so you're right now about your brother, are you coming out on Saturday night, you know? Uh, and, and they just want to scream and say, what do you mean? Am I all right about my brother and I coming out? They just don't get it. So I would say that for older siblings to, to, tr to try to, to, to identify a friend who understands, and it's usually somebody who's lost someone. They need one real friend of that sort of, of their sort of age, um, you know, same sex, different sex, whatever, but <clears throat> who understands actually how it feels. Mm -hmm. And um, I think also what must be marvelous, and I've only seen it on a television program, are sort of peer group events um, in groups, which, which some charities do, do run. I, I, again, I think, the Child Bereavement Trust do do some uh, peer group sessions, mm -hmm. um, which is wonderful, and and Winston's wish as well. And there must be, you know, there must be that there'll be uh, there will be organisations. Of course, you've got to then encourage them to want to go because it's very sort of counter the culture of of, of wanting to go to things if you're aged between sort of fourteen and twenty five or something. Um, you just want to fit in, you see. Um, and so the easiest thing is to pretend it's not happened and and yet underneath probably lots of feelings of anger, guilt at being the one that survived. You know, if it's an illness, if it's if, if it's an illness, guilt at the one who didn't get the, the genetic composition that allowed the illness. I mean, it's so understandable, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. As Sharon's just put in the chat that we, we do have uh, compassionate friends as well. <clears throat> sibling uh, meetups. Yeah. Zoom. I mean, um, I would really um, encourage that. Uh, and I think they, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll be reluctant until the moment they've met somebody who's gone through something similar. And then they go, oh, my word, this is just life changing. Because mm -hmm. here's someone who they can, you know, do their messaging with and everything who actually understands what they're talking about. Yeah. It's so mm -hmm. isolating for young people so isolating um i just remember also that ridiculous sense of sort of failure at having not having a family that was just like a normal family crazy but you know you're so here's a little chat my 18 year old daughter yeah so it is hard um if if they won't talk will they write something down might they write something um it, it, it's a hard one, isn't it? It, it? It's a hard one because sometimes last person that a teenager wants to talk to is a surviving, um, it, it is a parent, you know. Um, but then is there someone else in the, in, in the wider picture, in the family or in the friendship group who could come alongside? Mm. Yes, and it can take time as well and may not do it. In the, in the time scale that you would like. No. And I'm thinking about my own daughter. It took her no. many, many no. years. I think over, my, over the years, I've found a, a particular moment where, where young people come forward is um, interesting that when they, when they perhaps getting, uh, meet someone they think they might like to marry or, they're, or they sort of, because they're fearful about getting close. And so it brings up lots of stuff. And um, so this sort of time around relationships, engagement, that kind of time can sometimes be a real moment where they realize there's something significant to address. Yeah. Similar and it's all, there. it's all there, it can all be helped and it can all be done. It hasn't gone anywhere, which is a good thing, but it, it's just, it's best not to put the lid on again, <laughs> but to say, let's, you know, let's, let's attend to this. Okay, we, we, we're going to have to close soon, but there was a question and um, a couple of questions about the bereavement journey and whether it's still running, Jane, and also yeah. could you say a little bit about Atalos and what, what, what Atalos does? Um, and then Certainly, we'll... well, I will. Um, so the bereavement journey is still running and it's running um, around the country, but at the moment, of course, it's running mostly online. So there is a website, and it's called the bereavementjourney.org. And uh, through there, it's possible to see where there will be courses running. Um, for example, 
um, there is one. So I should add that they mostly they, they mostly run out of churches, but it's not a faith based course. The, um, it's a it's a it's a, a course for uh, people of any faith or none. It's so, but uh, there is a course starting at the end of April, big one. And of course, if it's by as it's by Zoom, people can can join that if they wish. And so the bereavementjourney.org would be the place to find that. And at a loss is a wonderful charity that was started about five years ago by a colleague of mine, and I joined her as a trustee. And it's an umbrella organisation. It's an umbrella charity. Um, and it's a, it's a website based charity providing resources and information for the bereaved all over the country. So really, wherever you live and whatever's happened to you, you can put in um, who has died and how they died and where you live. And then sort of at the click of a button, you can see everything that's available in terms of support and help. Um, so it's a useful thing. And then there are resource pages and there's quite a lot of other pages as well. It's a very useful resource if you find as a bereaved person, as I did, that people ring you up if they want, if, they, if they've heard of something. And they say, we, we wondered if you'd know of anything. And it's, it's a very good resource to have at your fingertips, the atalos.org, as I say, and that's another um, website. Perhaps um, one of um, compassionate friends, people could, could just put the um, address into the chat. Yes, so it's at a loss dot org. I don't think Will's next door, but there's a bloke next door. Told you, didn't I? I don't know if someone's unmuted there. Is it possible to mute yourself? <laughs> I think that's it. So at a loss dot org, that's correct. And then the other one is the bereavement journey dot org. But they are they, there are links between the two. Um, so don't worry, you'll find. Um, lovely. Okay, well, thank you so much. Just um, thank you to Jane for her. As I said, I was completely mesmerized while you were talking, Jane. <laughs> uh, it was so moving. It was such uh -huh. a privilege to hear your story and hear um, the learning and the wisdom um, derived from, from your, your long experience and, and career. And I just found your words kind of hugely honest really and incredibly helpful and I could resonate with a lot of your experience I'm 16 years since the death mm. of my daughter and I, I really could resonate with your whole you know mm. how um, described um, how it's been for you and for many others so I hope for everyone here I can see from the comments actually that you know it, it, the um, Jane's words have been helpful for you too and I hope yeah, and that you've taken something, you know, something away from tonight um, as you try to move forward and find those glimmers of hope that um, that Jane mm. talked about, mm. um, and 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 go on with your lives as with them very with your children very much part of all you do um, as you live your life um, now. So huge thanks to Jane for taking the time to talk to us tonight and answer all the questions and comments. And thank you to all of you as well for your, in, your sharing, your, your contributions and your questions and your feedback um, to me. It says all, always been wonderful to be together and I always learn something new whenever I'm with you all. And I want to thank you and Jane for that. Hmm. So we very much hope to see you at our next event online, which is part of this series of talks. Um, so, and I just want to tell you a little bit about it. We're really excited actually that um, Dr. Joanne Cacciatore will be joining us at Compassionate Friends on the evening of Tuesday, the 4th of May. So that's the Tuesday after the May 1st May Bank holiday. Um, Dr. Jo is a bereaved mother. She's a grief researcher, an author, and an acclaimed public speaker. She's also got a huge Facebook following, um, if any of you um, want to look her up. Joanne's going to share with us how she survived the loss of her daughter and her own perspectives on love, loss, and the, the heartbreaking path of grief, and also about finding hope. Joanne is the author of the books Bearing the Unbearable, 
and the companion volume Grieving is Loving. And through the wonders of the internet, she'll be joining us from her home in the state of Arizona in, in the oh. USA. Hmm. So you'll find more details about Joanne's talk and how to register on the TCF website under online events. And we really, really hope to see you there. So thank you again so much for being with us this evening and hoping that you'll keep in touch with Compassionate Friends through all the different ways you can access our peer support through our helpline, our local support groups and one-to-one -one support, our Grief Companion Scheme if you live in an area where there's no local support, perhaps also our specialist online support groups that we've been running and our private Facebook groups and online forum. And if you find reading helpful, our wonderful library has books on all aspects of bereavement. Oh. Details of all our support is on our website at www.tcf.org.uk forward slash support or just call our helpline. Thank you uh, to you all and especially to Jane and sending, giving you all my very warm wishes for the rest of the evening. So just please do leave the Zoom room when you're ready in your own time. Everybody. Jane, I hope you'll stay on. For